Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Commissioner. Can everyone hear me? Because I've been told that I am speaking too softly. Good morning, Commissioners. Before Mr. Matrele continues with his evidence, might I hand up a document? We've made three copies of the document. Um, you will recall yesterday that there was some issue about Harith General Partners and when Mr. Moliketi became a director of the company. We now have the, the um, full document, which gives the whole history of the company, as issued, as issued by the CIPC. And it indicates, as I said yesterday when Mr. Holomisa was being cross-examined, that Mr. Moliketi became a director of Harith GP on the 23rd of May, 2012. If I, if I might hand it up uh, to the commission. Um, it would have to have an exhibit number. So, sorry, your, your microphone. Sorry, my last one was exhibit four that I have here. I don't know if you went to five. Five. Thank you, Commissioner. So this one will be exhibit five. Thank you, Chair. Yes. What? No, they'll find it. Um, Chair, I've, I've just been informed that the big schedule of PIC unlisted investments was Exhibit 5. So perhaps if this one could be marked Exhibit 6. And then you'll see on the list of directors uh, Mr. Mr. Moriketi's name. And next to his name, the, the date on which he became a director. Thank you. Mr. Machuele, are you still under oath? Thank you. You may be seated. Mr. Machuele, could you um, turn on your microphone, please? Yesterday, um, you we're giving evidence, and I believe you got to the end of paragraph nine of your statement. Mm -hmm. You told the commission about the contract between yourself and the facilitation trust. If you could continue with, um, with your statement from paragraph 10. Following internal procedures, the PIC loan to the PIDF facilitation trust seed capital in an initial amount of just over 17 million rands, reflected in a facility agreement. And this is captured in ex uh, page 29 to 45, I think, of Exhibit 3 in the document. The loan was also approved by National Treasury and then also by the Minister of Finance at the time, Mr. Trevor Manuel, with the full recommendation of the PIC board. A copy of a progress report dated for April 2006 and of the approval and the, and, and the recommendation dated July 2006 are also included in the bundle at pages 46 to 50. And page 67 to 69 of my, in the exhibit three, also like no list, the approval which was granted by Treasury, you know, in all, uh, for the establishment of the facilitation trust, the provision of the facilitation trust loan, and the establishment of the trust. And if I may, uh, Commission, uh, uh, on, uh, in, in Exhibit 3, on pages uh, 67 to 69, That is the, 
update uh, 67 to 69 is the uh, update report which was written on to, to Minister Trevor Manuel at the time about the progress of the, of the fund and that had been undertaken. Uh, yes. And also mention of the loan is also mentioned in there. Paragraph 11. All right. Um, let's rather deal with this with the loan and finish it off here, I guess, because it doesn't come up again, I guess. Um, the repayment, when one looks at the agreement, I couldn't get clearly in terms of repayments of the loan, and then was there any security package surrounding that particular loan? Those are the two questions. Your microphone. Okay. The, the loan to the facilitation trust of 17 million rands was, uh, was approved by National Treasury, approved by the Minister of Finance. There wasn't a, uh, a security package as such for that since it was in any way seen as to being an initiative that the PIC is sort of like, uh, you know, uh, 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 putting forward. And with regards to in the manner, uh, it, I think it also provides for it in the, in the loan agreement that the interest rate would be at 10%, but how these are repaid, Commissioner, is that once the fund gets closed and you have like you know, all the investors having made their commitments, you get what is initially called a, uh, uh, an establishment fee of 1%, which is charged to all the investors. And out of that 1%, that's why you get a situation that at the end of 2007, once the fund was closed, the whole 22 million rand and in interest was then repaid to the PIC. Yes, because you get the management fees from the, the fund. The fund, and then yes. And you can then repay Pay the particular yeah. loan. Yeah. Okay. But perhaps just like read for even before the management fee, there's an initial, what they call an establishment fee, charged to all the investors of 1%. And that is what was used to make sure, because the management fee of the one quarter just on closure wouldn't have like sufficed to have paid all the uh, 22 million rands back to the PIC. So that's how it was like covered. Paragraph 11. The PIDF was formally established. We set about establishing the managing company whose sole responsibility would be to manage the funds to be invested in the PIDF. We embarked on fundraising roadshows to find private sector investors, pension funds, and development financed institutions who would invest in the PIDF and who would also believe in the vision of the African Renaissance. The GPF through its Board of Trustees, approved and committed itself in principle to an investment contribution to the PIDF of $250 million on 11 December 2006. If you look at page 70 of Exhibit 3, it's the actual letter which came from the, from the GPF, signed by the chairperson of the GPF at this stage, Mr. Martin Kaskas, and it's also, I think, important to also like note in terms of in that letter. That letter, the approval, is to the Pan-African Infrastructure Development Fund. It is not to the PIC. That's why I keep on reiterating the direct connection between the PIDF and, uh, and, and the relationship with her fund managers as opposed to this going through the PIC. And even in the, uh, uh, the letter addressed to myself and addressed to the Pan-African Infrastructure Development Fund. I continue. We subsequently established Health Fund Managers, the fund managing company devoted exclusively to the management of the PIDF. As I had said earlier on, once you create the fund, you need a manager who then manages uh, that. And that was uh, Health Fund Managers. The fund was never Sorry, intended... At that time, at that time, in terms of Harith, yes. what was the ownership structure or the shareholding structure of Harith FM? 
At that time in October, uh, November, October 2007, it was 100% held by the PIC at that time. And prior to that, Harris had been held by you? Yes, because I got the shelf company. I actually got two shelf companies because they were going to be for this purpose. And then the PIC insisted at the time that uh, give it to us, we will hold it. So in terms of when it was you holding Harith as yourself, the money that was deposited or uh, agreed to by the GEPF went into Harith when you were owning it? No, the money did not go into Harith, uh, uh, Chair. What happens is that when the GEPF commits, or all the investors, when they committed in October 2007, they commit by way of a commitment letter, I understand not their that. funds. I understand that. Yes. I'm saying, did any funds go into Harith when you were the sole owner of it? No. Any funds at all? There was no drawdowns? No, there was no drawdowns then. And then because you wanted, according to your own letters originally, to yes. get the permissions to set up the PAIDF, that it should be managed externally, yes. you went from the PIC into that. There was no procedure to look at who could be the best CEO for a fund manager. It was you transferred from within the PIC to um, Harith. No. I did a, from the PIC, I then did a, uh, was engaged on contract with the PIDF Facilitation Trust. So you were first with the Facilitation Trust on contract yes. to them? Yes. And then how did you go to Harith as the... CEO? When we closed the fund, I was then uh, uh, appointed as the CEO of the fund. I had been appointed running with by it. by who? By the PIC at the time, or by the shareholders and uh, also the investors. I think it was taken to be common cause that I'm the one who had been running around putting things together, putting so the So there was no team. search for a CEO either of the Facilitation Trust or Harith, it was just assumed that you were the best person from within the PIC and transferred into those positions? Yes, Chair. And therefore, during that period when you were at the Facilitation Trust, was it the PIC that paid your salary? It was the Facilitation Trust. That paid your salary? Yes. So you it, ceased it, getting It was a income. consultancy agreement in a way. It was a consultancy agreement yes. that that became part of the expenses of the Of facilitation the Facilitation Trust. trust. And from that time onwards, yes. you no longer received a salary from the PIC? Yes, Chair. Including when you went into Harith? Yes, Chair. Then you were paid from within whatever income came into Harith? Yes, Chair. Okay. Mr. Math Mr. Mathrelli, can I refer you to page 51 of the bundle? Do you see that document? Yes. Can you just describe what that document is? This is a memor uh, an agreement entered to into between the African Infrastructure Development Facilitation Trust and myself, which spelled out my, uh, my services that I would offer to the Facilitation Trust and what that would entail. And this agreement was signed in about June of 2006, which we see from page 66. Yes, this was signed in June 2006 after I had left the PIC. Yes, you referred to this document yesterday, I believe. Yes, I did. And then if you look at page 70, 70, 73, from 73 to What is that document? After the, the fund was closed in October, and after... October it, of which year? Of 2007, and after the fund had been incorporated, the fund manager created to manage the fund, because you need a, manage, a company to manage that. The PIDF needs to a contracting manager, which was HFM. I was then uh, given a, an executive fixed-term employment contract which is between Herod Fund Managers and Tsepo Matrele. And, and if you look at page 75, do you have it? At paragraph 233, 
we see that the contract term, the initial term of your contract was for seven years. Yes. And 235 shows that the effective date of that agreement was the 1st of September 2007. Effective date means the date on which the executive's employment with the employer commences being 1 September 2007, notwithstanding date of signature hereof. Yes. The thing is that by that time we had already been concluding the agreements of the PIDF in terms of like you know, finalizing the whole establishment thereof and we had secured enough uh, commitments from investors to like be fairly certain that the fund is now gonna be established. And I just for following your, your points, can we just get an indication from both of those agreements who signed off as the counterparty to Mr. Mafelwe? Who signed for the PAIDF? The PAIDF which, which page, which That's page 66? The PAIDF facilitation trust uh, if I'm not wrong, I think that was signed at the stage by Mr. Brian Molefe. Yes. Okay, so it was a PIC signing off on that? No, it was Pan African Infrastructure Development yes, Fund. Yes, but signed by Facil Brian Molefe. Yes, Facilitation Trust. Yes, I um, understand that, but the yes. Brian Molefe was the CEO of the PIC. Yes. I'm just saying that this is, I'm not arguing with you, I'm just trying to get clarity of what this relationship was between the PIC and the signing off because the PIC signed off on behalf of the Facilitation Trust. So in essence, it's still the link back to the PIC is all I'm trying to establish. And then when Harith signs for you on page 90, it is done by the chairman of Harith, which is Jabo Malaketi. Yes. Correct. Yes. But so can I, if I may, Chair, uh, <coughs> argue that a separate legal entity to drive this process was created with two trustees, being Brian Mulefe and uh, Professor Wiseman Nkutlu. And when I contracted for that period and for that service in that time after I had left the PIC, I contracted with the PIDF Facilitation Trust and with the, one of the trustees thereof. And when I contracted with Harith Fund managers after I had left PIC and had left the Facilitation Trust, a legal entity established then, Coherent Fund Managers, which is now going to be the manager of the PIDF, signed by the chairman, ex officio, like who was like you know, the chairman of the fund managers, which was uh, Mr. Jabu Muleketi then. The, the, the Herald Fund Managers had its own board at the time. I understand that. Yes. And that was comprising of the different investors in their different shareholdings. Y yes. Yes. And Jabu Malaketi at that time, was he still chair of the PIC? Yes. Yes. That's all I'm trying to establish. Okay. No, thank you, Chair. Can I continue? Just give me a minute. I'm sorry, can you continue? Yes, thank you. You may continue. You are at paragraph 12, I believe. Thank you. The fund was never intended to be a public sector-led initiative. On the contrary, the investors agreed to invest in the PIDF expressly on the basis that they would not be subject to a fund governed by the strictures of the PFMA and that they themselves would have an equity stake in the management company. And therefore, the right as shareholders to appoint directors to each board. The whole idea was that the investors themselves would be able to determine the progress of the management company and the manner in which their own funds were to be dealt with. Let's stop there a bit. Um, the GEPF put uh, money into the fund 
but the PIC funds the founding of the company. I mean, it becomes very confusing because it would mean that the GPF should be having the shareholding rather than the, PA, the PIC, but now we see the PIC giving you a loan, you know, the trust, and it becomes uh, mixed up. You know, can you please explain that? Uh, thanks, Chair. In, in my view, there is no confusion about the matter. The PIC, the PIC is an asset manager owned by the state. The PIC manages funds of the GPF and other funds, like there's other entities, I think like the UIF and everything and all those that it does that. The PIC as a manager, I think looks at other ways in which perhaps like it was looking at its own sustainability in terms of there was also the whole issue of like its own reliance on just managing the one, uh, this one major fund. So the PIC out of its operations funded this initiative of the facilitation trust, this initiative to try and establish another business line or another revenue stream through which they could do that. So therefore this was not even done out of the funds of the GPF. The GPF then looks at this individually on its own, on the basis of looking at an investment directly in the fund, as opposed to an investment in a speculative venture of trying to establish a fund manager to go raise a fund. Two separate entities, and I think that's why they prefer to keep it uh, that way. But then, the other investors like APSA and Old Mutual end up getting shares in the vehicle later, but the GPF doesn't get the shares. Not all the investors chose to have shares. Those who chose to have shares are those who felt that, if you look at the time, in 2006, it was fairly myself and one or two other individuals trying to get this thing going. And that's why I told like even one of the first entities we went to, we even went like to like to the IFC, we said, would you partner up with us? We went to Old Mutual, would you partner up with us to do this thing? We went to, you know, uh, 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 APSA, would you partner up with this thing? And the whole idea was that to the extent that you're going to create this fund of this magnitude, we'd also like to be close to it. And then to actually perhaps even help you in a way in terms of like, you know, if that goes with this, because one of the things you buy in a fund management company is also like the team. And then they felt that to the extent that they could be closer to the team, perhaps they want to be also like close, uh, be part of the management company. And if you remember then, uh, banks and some of these institutions also had some of like their, uh, you know, uh, uh, private equity fund managers. And even at the time, I think one of the reasons why we even went to like to, to all mutual was that we, you know, we said, you know, you've got uh, AIM, can we partner you with you in this regard? And that was why, and there were those who then chose to not be in, and then there were those who chose to like, look, we will, we, we will be in the, in the fund manager. Okay. While you're dealing with that, perhaps I can ask a question which I think comes later, but I would ask it now. In offering shares to investors, did you have a mandate to do that? In uh, offering shares to investors, uh, the investors uh, insisted, some of them, some of them like asked that they want to be participants in the fund manager. And that's why from the beginning it was said that, you know, we would like to be. That's why you had like, you know, from an entity like APSA, a commitment in excess of $125 million, who said like, you know, we're gonna give you like you know, a nice big commitment, but we'd also like to be part of like the, the fund management company. And this was in 2007? Yes, 2000, 2006, 2007, yes. But, but did you have a mandate to do, to offer shares to investors? Yes, uh, and as you can see, uh, Chair, even in the initial uh, memo that I read earlier on of 2005 that we even wrote to the GPF there is, we do allude to that fact that like these funds would be and then that we would also look to some of the other partners and investors into that. It was not me just saying we'd like to just do that. 
So your communication to the GEPF stipulates that you can offer shares to investors and the GEPF did not, because their reply does not s uh, approve that as I can recall that reply from Mr. Couscous. But the second question is, if that was agreed, why did it take so long? And with some, from the documentation, unless I'm not a pre, uh, fully understanding some of that documentation, mm -hmm. why did it become a point of dispute or difference? And why did it take until 2009 to transfer shares? That was exactly the big war which happened during that time and actually caused a big rift at the time between even like HFM and, uh, and PIC uh, chair. Because what happened is that at closure, there was actually some draft shareholders agreement, which then like, you know, the, 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 the investors and the fund manager had agreed to as to like, you know, who would be all the participants in the, in the fund manager. After the fund was closed, and as you can see, earlier on, like in 2008 and everything, the investors started writing to the PIC and said, this fund was not intended to be this way. I think there is a clause, I can actually find it in some of my things, which actually... Find the clause, but continue explaining it, that's okay. fine. Okay, which actually said to the GIP by the PIDF, the PIDF said to the PIC, we as investors came into this fund on the proviso that it would not be a public sector owned entity. We came into this fund on the proviso that certain uh, uh, shareholders would have participation in the fund manager. Sorry, and just this for clarity for me, sorry to interrupt, just for clarity for me, at that point in time, the PIC still owned 100% of it? Yes. Okay. And it then, when this was resolved, it reduced to 46 and the others had different shareholding? Yes. Okay, but and continue. Sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to be clear. Okay. Because that's a, and it happened over a period of, I think, 18 months, Chair. And that's actually when it got to a point whereby actually the investors gave notice to terminate the management agreement between Harris Fund Managers and PIDF because the PIC had refused to give over the shareholding structure into like the way HFM was supposed to be. Mr. Mathrele, can I, can I refer you, while we're on that, it is a bit ahead in your statement, mm. but if I can refer you to page 93 of, of Exhibit 3. Yes. I Actually, think that, that's yeah. the letter that you were looking for. This is the letter that I was looking for. In, uh, the fund closed in uh, October, November 2007. There was some draft shareholders agreement which had been put together, which would be done. And then the, at the time, the PIC said, look, we will resolve these issues after closure. Let us close this fund and whatever, and then we will finalize the shareholding structure. That's what it said to the investors. By May 2008, it still had not done that. There was also like, there was a whole lot of many iterations between this, whereby the PIC said, no, we will give you some phantom shares in this entity and keep 100% which the investors refused and everything. And then in, on 29th of May, 2008, actually the, chair, the chairman of the PAIDF uh, at that stage writes then to the chairman of the PIC, Mr. Philip Jabulani Muleketi, chairperson board of directors of and, Earth. And Mr. The, cha the chairperson of the PAIDF was the same Mr. Martin Kuskus, yes. who was the chair of the Board of Trustees of the GEPF. Yes. He was uh, chairman of the Board of Trustees of, uh, of, uh, of GPF, but he was also like the chairman of the, of the Board of Trustees of, of, uh, of PIDF by virtue of their investment in the fund. And actually, GPF had two representatives on the board of the PIDF. And perhaps if you could just read out paragraphs four and five. I think that's what you were looking for. I'd like to start by paragraph three, if I may, counsel. You may. Uh, this is written to like the chairperson of Herod Fund Managers, which is the uh, Philip Jablanum Lekete, who's also at the time uh, the chairperson of the PIC. The reason why PIC initially acquired the entire issued share capital of Herod was that PIC operations decided to support the establishment of PIDF by one, forming a company, Harris, for the purpose of establishing PAIDF. B, 
making a loan facil facility of approximately 17 million rands available to Herat to pay the establishment costs of PAIDF. Paragraph 4. It was never the intention, nor was it ever contemplated, the PIC would remain the only shareholder of Herath. Herath set out raising capital for PIDF, and during discussions with certain proposed investors, it was made very clear that any investments were subject to the investors acquiring a shareholding in Herath, which is not unusual in funds of this nature. Just for clarity then, in terms of the different shareholding that comes under six, Yes. and bringing it up to date. Yes. Were those shareholdings actually then transferred to those entities in those amounts, being the PRC then still holding 40% and the others as reflected in that document? And what is the situation as at today in terms of the shareholding? Because now, Harith, if I mean, the question of PIIDF1 is a closed fund. Mm -hmm. What is the shareholding of the PIIDF1 at this point? Uh, Harith or PIIDF? PAIDF. Okay. Shareholding of PAIDF. This is what this says here. Yes. That this is the question of ensuring that this was the investment of shareholding. In Harith, um, Madam. In Harith. In Harith. Yes. Not PAIDF. Yes. Not PAIDF. Not yes. And therefore, given that Harith F1 became Harith GP, when that was transferred, I'm trying to get to whether there is any other shareholding other than the PIC and the Harith team in the in the Harith GP. Okay. And Harith, was this ever transferred into the Harith FM? Did they become shareholders? What happened to that shareholding? What is the state today? Mm. Uh, Chair, this was uh, May 2008, and uh, this the shareholders, as they are listed here, were the ones who at that stage had agreed that they would want shareholding and that this is the way it would be. And what's also important to note is that like, uh, this is what the shareholders, the investors in PIDF accepted because then the PIC would be low 50% uh, and this would make this entity not a uh, PFMA subject entity. The, DBS, the, the, the African Development Bank at the stage for its 10%, you know, in addition, as you know, I, I mean, the African Development Bank is a, is a DFI, and wherever I invest and everything, like, it has all these uh, immunities and all sorts of, like, protections and whatever. And they also insisted on having those in the fund management company. And uh, I think in terms of, like, uh, Reserve Bank and like you know, National Treasury, it was not possible to be able to give those immunities in a fund management company of this nature because there were all these other shareholders. So the African Development Bank actually ended up not getting said, no, it's fine, then like, you no, know, we will not participate then in the, in the fund uh, manager. And you see there, there's an entity called SICAD Investment Partners as to 30%. That entity is the initial name of what her was Harith Fund Managers. And we, because before we came up with the name of Harith, the initial uh, name we had used was Psyched uh, uh, Investment Partners. And that was the entity which was gonna hold the shareholding of the management team. It was subsequently then changed to like you know, uh, uh, HSIST through a trust as opposed to an, uh, a PTY Limited. And I was also explained at the time, because at the time, actually, I, uh, you know, got these two shelf companies, which was both, there was there had some other names, but then we changed each one to Psyched Fund Managers and another one to Psyched Investment Partners. And I will explain later on, like, you know, why we had two and how, how that was going to happen. But then it ended up, the final one being that because African Development Bank did not come in, uh, it was decided that that 10% would be shared amongst, you know, the other uh, three entities, which would be ourselves, uh, Old Mutual, and APSA. Uh, in the end, Old Mutual and APSA were given their share, and we were not given our share of that 10%. And I think it was all a matter of, like, 
the environment and then the standoff at that time between, uh, in a way, uh, HFM and, 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 and PICs uh, insisting at a time that it actually wanted more. And that's how they ended up with 46% in HFM, Chair. Mr. Mathwele, I think you misspoke when you were speaking about SICAD. You said that was the original name of Harith FM. Yes, the, that was a shelf company. It was based something, whatever. Yes. And uh, we then was changed it, it to SICAD Investment Partners and then changed it. Once we had set up the entity, we decided, like, let's find a very different name. And that's when we came up with uh, Harith Fund Managers. So it's not Harith GP, Harith Fund Managers. No, this is Harith Fund Managers. This was in 2007. Harith GP was not used then. This was 2007, the initial entity uh, which we used to, hold, uh, to contract with PAIDF. But this, this letter is talking about taking shares in Harith, being Harith FM. Yes. So how can, Her how can SICAD, if, it's, if that's Harith FM, be taking shares in Harith FM? No, SICAD Investment Partners, we had two entities. One was SICAD Fund Managers, one was SICAD Investment Partners. To hold the shares in Harith, we were going to use SICAD uh, Investment Partners to hold the shares in SICAD Fund Managers. Many fund managers like you no know, use that interchange between like you no know, one would be the fund manager and then the entity that they use to hold their shares, which is separate from the fund management company, is like investment partners. So that's where that's how we we're gonna hold that. But in the end we ended up using uh, the trust, which is Harris Chain Center Scheme Trust, as opposed to a uh, a PTY limited. And actually that entity is the entity which actually later on, you know, we kept uh, dormant, never used, and then later on changed to Harris General Partners. Mm. It never worked between 2007 and 2012. And then can I just take you, I don't want to jump in your statement, but if I can just ask you to go to page 95 of the bundle um, to finish off the letter from Mr. Couscous, paragraphs 8 and 9. This is the letter of 29 May 2008. Your microphone. Paragraph uh, 8. This is the letter from Mr. Kaskas, chairperson of the board of PAIDF. We are hard pressed to understand the reason for PIC's risk culture. Uh, this is big English. We are hard pressed to understand the reason for PIC's risk culture when it was made unequivocally clear by the investors that their investment into PIDF were intricably linked to intricably linked. My tongue is a bit tight today. Please, Chair, bear with I, me. I think it's inextricably. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chair. I think it's my fourth language I understand, English. I understand. Okay. Linked to holding shares in Harith and in the proportions contemplated by the draft shareholders' agreement. We hereby request that the shareholding arrangements envisaged in paragraph 5 above and as contained in the most recent draft of the shareholders' agreement be confirmed by no later than Friday 30 May 2008 and thereafter implemented by no later than Friday 27 June 2008, failing which the investors will proceed with our remedies available at law. Uh, and for us... Chair, this was the whole crux of the issue because even beyond this date, you know, beyond May and June, up to December, the shareholding was never changed. It actually ended up in December 2008, PAIDF board actually giving notice to terminate without cause the agreement between PIDF and Harris Fund Managers to manage the funds of PIDF and giving six months notice without cause that the, the manager wrap up and give back the management, the, all the documents and everything relating to PIDF. No, no, it's fine. I, it's fine. I just want clarity then of what was the final outcome of this? Did the shares get 
transferred into at some point because that is, I think, 2009 when that occurs. Can, can I and ask? And into you? which which entities that can, had this? Because obviously, African Development Bank was in a different category, and that whether any of those investors moved with the fund to Harith GP as shareholders. Can I ask Mr. Matwele to, to con I think he's dealt with um, everything up to the end of paragraph 16. So if you can start at 17, you'll see exactly how it all unfolded. S 17. Thank you. <laughs> uh, You've just dealt, in your, in your statement at paragraph 16, mm. you dealt with a letter from Mr. Couscous up yeah. to page 95 of the bundle. Okay, great stuff. Paragraph 17. A compromise was reached and the Herath Fund manager shareholding was restructured with the approval of the then Minister of Finance, Mr. Pravin, Mr. Pravin Godan and the PIC board, as reflected in a letter of 26 May 2009. This is like evident also in like pages, uh, page 96 to 98 of my uh, exhibit, which is uh, the approval letter, which came from uh, uh, Mr. Pravin Godan. And I might also like note at that stage that uh, whilst uh, Mr. Brian Mulefe was still the CEO at this time, um, this was after 2007 chair, and in 2008, we remember then there was then the uh, change of cabinet and uh, like uh, the 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 resignation or the recall of. President Tabumbeki and uh, Mr. Jabum Lekete at that stage, which was, I think, September, October, somewhere there, uh, like, you know, resigned with, uh, with, 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 uh, with some of those cabinet ministers then with President Tabumbeki. And as a result, stopped being uh, the, the chairperson of the PIC. And that's why in this thing, like even the approval in 2009, is then by Minister Pravin Godan, whose uh, deputy at that time was uh, Mr. Nklantlanene. Yes, and in 17.2, 17 yeah. That, that's where I talked about the whole issue of how like it moved from, you know, in terms of like, you know, whereas even the approval by uh, uh, Minister Nene said that like the health employee share trust to have 36 percent, it ends up only with PIC having uh, 30 percent, and despite all sorts of like. No, no, Mr. Mr. Mafrele, yes. you said the PIC landed up with 30 percent, but that's no, not no, so. no. The PIC if landed we, up with 46 percent. Yes, if, yes. If we can just, if I can just um, summarize this letter at page 96 yes. says that. 12% uh, would go to Old Mutual, 12% would go to ABSA, 36% to the HSIST, and 40% to the PIC. Yes. But we know that subsequent to that, the PIC went, landed up with 46%, in other words, 6% more than what is contained in this letter, and the HSIST had 6% less, going from 36% to 30%. If you can just explain how that happened. Okay, uh, through you, Chair. What happened is that at the time, as I had said, that African Development Bank, because they couldn't be afforded all the immunities and everything which they normally have in any uh, country in the fund management company, they decided that they would no longer participate in the fund management company. Uh, in HFM, so therefore it was then decided that that 10% would be split proportionally between APSA, All Mutual, and ourselves. APSA and All Mutual got their proportional 2%, and uh, 
the employee trust did not get its proportional 6%. So, yeah, even despite our whatever. So, so that's the way it's ended up. But, but how was it that the PRC managed, if you look at this letter at 96, mm -hmm. uh, and in particular at, at page 97, paragraph 2.5, it says there, and this is, this it says is, the PRC, says will, the still PRC remain will remain with 40% 40 40 of shares in Harith consequent to the sale of the shares. Yes. So in other words, the PRC would go from 100% down to 40%. Yes. But, but the PRC landed up with 46%. So how was it that the PRC managed to go from 40, as, as set out at page 97, to 46? In our negotiations, Chair, uh, yeah, we, were just, we were just denied the 36%, the, the, the additional 6%, which was supposed to be proportional. I, I can't use other words to, to describe that in this forum. Can I, can I um, perhaps uh, ask Advocate Libba? Because don't forget the reason why we're here is to see whether there was any impropriety in the actions of the PIC. And the question of this shareholding and 6% up, down, whatever the end results are, is there must be an explanation for it. So Advocate Libba, perhaps in our further work, we just look at how that went from 46 to, from 40 to 46 in due course. Because Thank I think you. that's what the question here is, is what, what happened here? It can't just happen. There has to be reason and, and uh, explanation for it. It might be totally legitimate reasons and explanation, but we need to have that, and obviously that isn't something it is noted it that Mr. Matrello can respond to. Chair, that's one question I wouldn't mind that it be checked. <laughs> <laughs> Please, yes, I think you're at 17.3. The PIC obtained this substantial stake in Herod Fund Managers, the largest single shareholding, since it had provided a seed capital loan in an amount finally calculated at just under 22 million. It had a, this loan, as I said, it uh, had been done because PIC had this material interest in the overall success of the PIDF at the time. The seed capital loan has been fully repaid with interest to the PIC. The PIC retains still its 46% to this day without at any time be exposed to any risk on its own account. Sorry. Can I just say? Who was that? Okay, I got it. Okay, if, if I could just ask on that for some clarity because my understanding is you say it retains, the PIC retains 46% to this day, but Harris FM has nothing in it. So it's 46% of nothing. Chair, that's what Dr. Holomisa said yesterday. There is a whole lot in the 46%. The PAIDF is still contracted to HFM. That's the entity that manages it. And then the day-to-day -to -day management is still subcontracted, is subcontracted to HGP when HGP was connected. But then to HGP, PIDF still pays fees to, PI, to, 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 to HFM, which then like, you know, has subcontracted everything to HGP. And to the, at the end of the life of the fund, Chair, there is what we call a carry, which we believe that there will still be one, which will be like perhaps around 2023, 2024. And then the carry, is the outperformance above 8% that the fund achieves. To the extent that there is that carry chair, that will accrue to HFM. And that's where that 46% is there. And so to, therefore, the statement that HFM has been liquidated, dissolved, stripped, empty shell, is not, is not true at all. And HFM chair, if I may still say, still has a board of directors comprised of 
the initial shareholders. It's got a PIC representative on the board. It's got myself. It's got uh, uh, Mr. Chris Kuhn from Old Mutual. And it's got Ariane Sabita from, uh, from APSA. So they still sit as the board of HFM and also manage the subcontracting arrangement between health fund managers and HGP because that's the way it flows because we, 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 we couldn't change that the management of PIDF now go through to HGP it's because then the shareholders in uh, HFM didn't want to change their arrangements. I hope it makes sense. Tom, I think that I would like to pursue that a little bit later because otherwise we may just get stuck on it, but I just, perhaps we can draft something that actually explains this exactly, what was transferred, what exists in HFM properly so that one can see that these are the assets that remain in HFM and what has been transferred into HGP is the management of it and there's a contract between. I would just like us, perhaps between you and your council, um, and Advocate Libre, just to give us something in writing that explains this. Because I, I hear what you're saying, but I would just like to see what it actually reflects. Okay. Chair, actually, I'm sure before the end of the you know, when we did all the changeover in 2012, 2013, we had to like write to all our investors, we had to approve this, all the 10 investors in PIDF, all our creditors and everything in HFM, and we actually set out how the whole thing works even to the shareholders, old mutual, APSA, and everything. That pack is always there, and we will prepare and have the same for you, which explains how it was happened and why. Advocate Labo, if we could do that, I think that would help clarify this confusion about what has occurred here. It's noted, thank you. Mr. Mashwele, I don't want to jump in your statement, but just keep a, a finger where you are and just have a look at page 13 of your statement right at the top where you list the benefits paid to the PIC by HFM. And we see there that as recently as May of 2018, HFM is still declaring dividends. Is that correct? Please open your microphone. Yes, that's further on in my uh, statement. Yes. I think it's paragraph 39, which yes. spells out some of like the uh, dividends which had also like, been paid by, uh, by HFM. And uh, this remains in HFM after the management mm -hmm. uh, fee and everything which has been paid to HGP to do everything remains. Whatever sort of like, you know, uh, excesses remain in HFM is then de uh, declared to the, to the investors in HFM. And even, yeah, as, as you highlight, uh, uh, council, there were dividends declared in July 2014, July 2015, and July 2018. And the dividend declared to them, like, uh, I think for the past, what, three, four years, is like close to about nine, 10 million rands out of HFM. If, yes. uh, if, if and when a question is asked and you feel that you have dealt with it or you, are, you will be dealing with it in your statement, you can say so. Yeah, try to, yes, you know, you, you might answer uh, something briefly, but say there's a big, uh, you know, answer somewhere else. Yeah? Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. So okay. that we okay. just go paragraph okay. by paragraph. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and also just, I know you're going to get there, but the, the whole thing that you spoke about, about a carry, is, is dealt with in paragraph 20 of your statement. Okay. okay. But we'll get there. Do I... Maybe I can jump some of those since I've dealt with them and they are in the statement anyway. You move paragraph yes. by paragraph. <laughs> oh, oh, you go okay. paragraph by paragraph. Yeah. Thanks for the time, Chair. Can I go on? Yes, please. I'm now at what? 18? Yes. Or oh, 7? Yeah, yeah. 17. I'll go to 18. Five. We have dealt with the fleecing and the looting of the PIC by that one, so it's okay. Paragraph 18. Okay, just before you, we leave this section, there's a question from me. Um, just in terms of transferring shares, you normally do evaluation and all that. So did um, the new investors pay any money for their shares, you know, the APSAs and the, the old mutuals? Okay. Uh, yes, uh, they did. What happened is that when 
PIC in 2009 then uh, had to transfer over the shares to the different investors. It then declared a dividend to itself of all the funds which were in HFM. And at that time, Chair, then HFM was a shell, then there was nothing in it. Because all the money was then taken out and paid to the PIC. That's where PIC got this whole 70 million rands out of and in 2009. Clear, that's, and that's then the seven, price which seven. was then paid by uh, uh, Old Mutual for its 12% uh, was 1,200 rands, 1,200 for Old Mutual, for, 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 for APSA, and then uh, 3,600 for our 30% uh, 30, 30%. It was actually supposed to be 3,000 rand since we didn't get the whole 36%. Yes. Was that cash out, uh, the 77 million which you guys have referred to? That cash? No, it's cash paid out? 70 million. 70 million. Cash. Cash. Yeah, the cash paid out as a dividend. It was cash paid out as a dividend. As a dividend. All, all of it out of a yeah. uh, fund managers to the PIC operations. Yeah. Yeah. To reduce the, the balance sheet to some... To zero, to zero. The, yeah. Yes. To make the, the company. Right. Yes. Okay, I get that. Then and the next one is the shareholder trust. You know the H S I S T, the employee trust, owned thirty percent. Who were the people there? What was it? was that just you? <laughs> I wish, but then I wouldn't keep all my team. Che, <laughs> um, I have a, I have a document here, yeah. which I, if I could hand up. Uh, it would be Exhibit 7A, and it's, um, it's an affidavit which lists all the members of the HSIST. Um, I must just say that um, it's, it's signed by a commissioner of OATS, O-A-T-S, but that notwithstanding, I don't think it affects the validity of the document. I might have handed up, and it's, it, it lists all the beneficiaries of the trust. Okay, yeah. That, that and you, and while why, I'm while I'm suggest, on that, if why, I can, why do you suggest it's numbering a seven A, seven A and seven B Y? Six is here. Where's seven? Oh, because there are two documents, Chair. Okay. Um, the the one relates to the HSIST trust, mm -hmm. and the other one relates to the HTET trust. Um, okay. H H H E T trust, which yeah. relates to. Uh, Harris General Partners. Okay. So if right. I can hand up both of them, and they're both signed, they're both commissioned by the same commission of oats. Okay. So the second one, the second one will then be Exhibit Seven B. Seven B. Yes. I think I'm fine there, but I just want to ask another question. Maybe before you proceed, it might help for you to tell us more about private equity structures in the sense that how are they structured in commandant trusts, what is a fund, what is a fund manager, what is a carry, you know, just briefly because these points come up somewhere as we go along. How do you structure the whole thing, you know? Thank you, th thank you Chair. Um, let me see where I start. It's, uh, you know, in, 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 private equity tri in private equity fund managers, uh, a team goes out, invest, tries to influence investors about a certain thesis that they believe in that they can then get them to commit to to invest in a certain private uh, companies to buy and to get value out of and to exit and make them perhaps a return other than perhaps what they would get with perhaps buying government bonds or like, you know, investing in like, you know, uh, on the stock exchange or something. Something uh, which by, by its nature, private entities, by their nature also like most times perhaps slightly riskier sort of like transactions. And then you raise a fund and then uh, by 
then the fund, you know, depending on where you think you're best place to go raise investors who have an appetite for that type of risk, you then do that. It, it, takes, it, ta it takes time. And uh, uh, you then have a fund management company, and then you have then, there's different trusts. You get a event trust, and you get a vesting trust. And you also tend to find that, like, you know, one would be maybe beneficial in, in, in certain circumstances, and one would not, depending on, like, the tax treatment thereof. But basically, like, in most situations in South Africa, that's what you'd find. In other situations, you also find that now you can create also perhaps a limited partnership. But and that's where then all the funds or the commitments is made to buy whatever investors you find to do that. Uh, there are fund managers who sometimes register some of their funds in South Africa. We registered our fund, uh, and it was a trust, in, in South Africa. And because we also in that fund had also international investors, we also needed to get uh, Reserve Bank approval, which we sought and were given by the nature of like the special dispensary, which was given to PIDF to try and attract other non-South African investors into that fund. So therefore, then the fund manager then contracts with the fund, the investors, the fund itself, yeah. to say, we will manage this on this thesis of type of transactions we will get into for this type of fee, for this type of hurdle rate, and this is the way you will, uh, you know, reward us. Some funds, you know, say you will reward us on a basis of valuation each year as we achieve that hurdle. Some funds, which is in our case, it's like a more, I think, a more firm and sort of like more stricter sort of like principle, say, you know, we will reward you on the basis of the cash return you have made back to us. And that's the way you contract. And uh, in some instances, you know, when we started, the sort of like going rate like for funds used to be like in the region of about, you know, uh, 2%. And then with like you know a 20% carry, and then with a hurdle rate. Uh, now, you know it's uh, the market is tightening, and it has done that since about like perhaps the 2010 or so. You find that in your larger funds, like you know your fees are now reducing to about uh, for the big sort of like infrastructure funds in the U.S. and that about one percent. But funds on the continent, I think, still get away with about 2% for funds because of, like, by the nature of, you don't find big funds okay. on, yeah. in South Africa. No, no, okay, yeah. So, uh, just a um, quick one. And then uh, what is a carry trust? And uh, just explain LPs and GPs a bit, okay. just briefly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The GP is a general partner. That's the fund management company which manages, that would be like, in this case, Harris Fund Managers. That's what's called the GP. Health Fund Managers manages the fund on behalf of the PIDF. The PIDF, the investors in it's this a case, fund, yes. that it's like would a be the limited partner. PIDF is a fund, it's like a unit trust. Yes. 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 Yeah. That, that would be the limited partner. Yes. And okay. Is it meant for what? The carry is a motivation to the fund manager to the extent that they achieve any return above a certain hurdle rate, that they then start sharing that return with the investors in a proportion of 2080. Let's say above a hurdle rate of about what? Uh, 8%, the manager starts participating to the extent of 20% in the profits above that, and 80% to the investors, okay. yeah. to the limited partners. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Mashwele, can you start at paragraph 18? 
The investors also envisaged that a portion of the fund management company would belong to management for purposes of incentivization through an employee's equity trust. This is an industry norm. And as I said, in this case, we used uh, a trust. Initially, you know, when we registered PIDF and health fund managers, we thought that health fund managers would be like the fund management company, and we thought that we would hold our shares through uh, the, the other company, which would be like Cycad Investment Partners. But in the end, we ended up using the Harris Chain Center Scheme Trust. We ended up using a trust as opposed to a company. That's the difference. Okay. In accordance with the compromise with the PIC, therefore, the shareholders became, as to that stage in, um, I think, May 2009, the PIC 46%, all mutual life assurance 12%, APSA trading and investment solutions 12%. The Heritage Chain Incentive Scheme as to 30%. This trust permitted the employees, including myself, to participate indirectly in an equity share of the company, thereby incentivizing us over and above our salary entitlements. It's a precondition in the industry that these skilled employees who are necessary to administer and manage the funds under their control be offered such an equity share. Uh, normally in other entities, you'd also actually find that like normally the manager tends to hold 100%, but in our case, it was, our first, it was the first fund. The investors felt that they want to participate in that, and then they had like, you know, the capacity to be able to negotiate that for themselves. Of course, a management There's, company... Sorry, if you could just... It, it's in, th that mm -hmm. last sentence of 19.4, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like you to read out because I, I think you might want to elaborate on that. This deals with the issue, actually the issue of the carry. The employees receive no equity benefit unless and until the clients for whom they are managing and investing the funds have been fully paid out. I don't think it's as uh, when they have been fully paid out. It would be when they have achieved the hurdle rate of 8%. But in our case, it's not even a hurdle rate that must be by virtue of evaluation. The investors must have achieved the hurdle rate in terms of like cash back to them, which makes it an even much more strenuous, you know, uh, requirement to jump for any fund uh, manager. Uh. The, the carry, you know, the sort of hurdle rate, is that in dollar terms? Yes. The 8%? Yes. Is that in dollar terms? Yes. Because it looks like you guys are doing like 6% at the moment. Yes, it's about 6%. So mm. we haven't like participated in this uh, carry as yet, even after 13 years of managing this. And this is anyway, I think, chair, by virtue of the fact that, you know, we're dealing with, uh, with infrastructure assets. They take longer. Uh, the initial years in terms of the learning curves was, was slightly perhaps steeper than you know, what we thought. The deal flow and then the deal closures in the earlier years between 2007 and 2011 was not as, like, you know, as robust perhaps as what perhaps the deal flow is increasing now. And the uh, rate of closure of investments you know, didn't do that. And uh, we did have in one or two cases, also like one investment which didn't do that well. But in any case, we still actually even haven't had an, uh, an exit yet out of any of our investments. But uh, it is my belief that like, you know, within the next two years, we'll be starting to see the listing of one or two of our major assets within PIDF uh, one, which would really then like, you know, perhaps result in that situation whereby we'll be able to achieve that hurdle rate. Uh, fund one began around what, 20, 20, 2007 and it, and it ends when, 2024? Is that correct? Uh, 2023, there around, yes. Okay. But then with an additional year or two by, uh, by virtue of the, if, if the investors agree to that, to extend that. Yeah. And if you look at some, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. meaning that you are looking at, so, 2007 yes. to 2023, yes. it might go to 2025. Yes, is because correct? in the yeah. management agreement, yeah. you have a provision mm -hmm. which says that this is like a 15-year fund. Yeah. And at the time, it was the first 15-year fund on the continent mm -hmm. because we were trying to say like to the continent and to the world and to Africans that Africa needs much more longer capital 
to enable it to build infrastructure assets. And this was uh, the first, and I think even today we still remain one of like you know, only 15 year fund by virtue of the sector that we are targeting, targeting like you know, uh, more patient capital. But besides that, I think, Chair, I'd still like to say that even though that's like health rate hasn't been sort of like not cheap, from a developmental impact point of view, we have seen tremendous uh, impact in terms of some of the assets that we have like invested. Okay, in. good. Yes. You might still get your carry at some point in time in, in the future. I'll make sure I keep healthy and be able to do that, Chair. Thank you. But I still believe that that will be achieved. Uh, if I may, Chair, since we're talking about it, there's um, just two assets that we have in our portfolio. One is a fiber optic company which should be able to come to the market soon with a market cap, perhaps nothing, less than maybe, if I were to be conservative, 18 billion rands. And we have like about a 35% uh, share in that runabout. Also within the next two years, we also have an entity called Energy, which is about uh, two gigawatts of power under its management, which is like, you know, touching in excess of like about 30 million Africans across the continent. And we have um, uh, aggregated uh, some of our power assets together with those of AFC. And we hope that within the next two to three years, we can be able to lose that power company. And we believe that like, you no, know, that entity uh, too should do very well in terms of once it comes to, to market. And it's the nature of the assets, I think, that we look at. These are entities with lifespans and uh, power purchase agreements and concessions, mm -hmm. nothing less than 25, 30 years. So therefore, it is a long-term game. Okay. Let's continue. Okay. Am I at 20 now? Yes. I've dealt with this. Can I go to 21? You may. Uh, and also in 21, Chair, I deal with all the issues which deal with, you know, infrastructure. It is necessary that I provide a snapshot of what infrastructure investment in Africa Mr. until this point usually entailed. Mr. Matlele, yeah? um, you, you can go through this, but I think you, you already dealt with this yesterday all the way up to paragraph 26. Okay. Unless, unless the commission Thank wants... You. Yeah, I just want to go back. Yeah, sorry. Can I go back to paragraph 20? Yes. Paragraph 20. Can you just explain to us how you how the fees arrangement work work and issues like you know you you mentioned bonuses here and other things just broadly without talking about the actual numbers how how fees get into the management company what types of fees are those management fees versus operation fees and then how are they expended broadly, and especially issues like bonuses, you know, because there is no carry yet. Thank you, Chair. Uh, quarterly, we charge our investors uh, a fee uh, of, on average, like, you know, in the first fund, about one point. Uh, 75 percent because like up to two percent uh, up to 500 million you like charge two percent and anything above that you charge a lesser fee 1.5 percent and then in uh so that's a fee we charge quarterly and that's what the investors pay and that's what sort of like sustains us the issue of a carry as i've said has not been uh earned in terms of like you know, PIDF1 as at this stage. The issue of, you know, bonuses to the management team, the way we do that in our fund is that, you know, because we know that in the nature of our class, which is infrastructure assets, the carry takes 
It's not like in a usual private equity thing whereby five years in and five years out you start appreciating the carry. In this stage, like you know, we are even beyond 10 years before you start even getting the carry. It's more than uh, we have a, a bonus scheme which is then budgeted for out of like the fees that we get. So therefore, there's a lesser sort of like, you know, uh, you know, uh, guaranteed, uh, guaranteed salary, and then uh, bonus is is uh, is budgeted out of our the same fee which we get. So therefore, those are the fees that we would get and be able like to like then have an annual bonus out of, dependent on our performance, as evaluated by our board for that year. And then the 1.75 percent is based on what amount? That, that's the, if I may, I, I just gave the average for mm -hmm. like you no know, the one point. Uh, the initial like 500 is like you no know, at, uh, at two percent mm -hmm. of, of fund one, and mm -hmm. then like anything above that is one and a half uh, percent. Mm -hmm. And then in uh, PIDF two, the fee is actually less. I think the the fee in uh, PIDF two is. It's 1.5 percent, if I'm not wrong, 1.75. It's lesser, and that's what we've seen across the industry yeah. uh, going forward. Sure, yeah. sure. But, but give us some sense. The if we take 1.75, yes. What is it based on? On 650 million dollars, or or what? what, what the the, the 1.75 would then be initially for the first seven years. Mm -hmm. You are then like charge a fee in our particular case. Many funds have it differently. They charge uh, fees differently by the way they negotiate with their investors. Mm -hmm. In our case, the initial seven years was based on the commitments because the initial seven to eight years were based like, were seen as the investment period. Mm -hmm. Then that's the fee that you charge. Yeah. And from year eight or nine to like you know, the end of the life of the fund, mm -hmm. then it's based on the... Uh, uh, the value of the assets as independently, you know, valued and audited, the, the, the cost of the assets, yes. Yeah. Not on the sense, commitment, yeah. yes. But, but, yeah, but uh, give us a sense. So on the 1.75, what is based on what, $600 million? What is it per annum in dollars and in rents? Just, just say, give I us a sense. I think the 1.75, you know, would be based on about, uh, I think, into like the current thing about in the rich, Commissioner, I could be wrong because now it's based on what you call the the the, the, the costs of the investment. So I think now for Fund One, I'd be in a region of about uh, 600, 600, 600 million. Uh, million dollars. Yeah. But the, the, there is a step down, I think, and I, I can't. Yeah, but I, 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 I'll then, share that. Yeah, roughly, yeah. and then we we can get the the correct yeah. numbers. So yes. you say. 1.75 times yes. 600 million dollars. Yes. What are we talking about? 11 million dollars or so? Is that correct? Yeah, 11, I, I, 10, I think you'd say dollars. like the annual management fees. If I were like to give you yeah. like yeah, the rent, like equivalent, you know, depending on whether mm -hmm. uh, the, the discounting or what the rate would be at a particular time, I'd say like our management fees per per annum since about uh, I think for the last few years. Mm -hmm. Average is about uh, uh, 110, between 110 and 90 million rands. In yes, in rands. Yes. About 10 million dollars or yes. so yes. per annum. Pe no, 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 less than that. 10 million would be about 140 million yeah. rands. Okay, yes. so it's about 8 yeah. million dollars yes. or so. Okay. Yes. All right, per annum. Yes. So you said it's, it's 100 million for the past year? For, I, I think like for the past. In 90 for the. For the past three, four years? Yeah. Yes. And the manage to meet all the costs and then all the bonuses, and then you can declare dividends too. I mean, do, do you make some good profits there from the 100 million per annum? Give us some sense of the costs and the, the profits. Okay. Uh, I think, uh, Chair, in terms of uh, in the current period, you know, we. But by the nature of like, you no, know, actually like fund one coming to us like the end of it, sort of like, you know, the next couple of years, that the fee has like proportionally reduced. And that's why it was important 
because had we not even like started like uh, fund two and all the other initiatives that we have into like uh, the funds we've established in Nigeria, the funds we've established in, uh, in, in Namibia, our fee out of one fund would not have been able to cover our costs in totally as, as a fund manager. That's why we needed to start other initiatives and start doing that. And we've actually seen that uh, even the investors, the fee is much lower in fund two because from about 2010, investors started reducing their uh, management fee to private equity funds. And so the fee would not have been like sufficient to do. That's why we have started other initiatives as her general partners and uh, to manage other funds. But do you, I mean, do you, this, re, this revenues, mm. do they cover costs? And do you issue out dividends to the PIC and the, the other people in HFM? Okay, no, in, in HFM, uh, what uh, remained, you know, in, in, in 2018, as it was actually 2017, 18, there was like, you know, a, uh, a, a what you call a surplus, which I think I remained, I think it was in the region of about like what, eight million or so. And then that was then sort of like uh, uh, paid out as a dividend. As you can see in that schedule, that HFM, that PIC got something. In HGP, and that's where the, like, you know, we've needed to start other things for the sustainability of, of the team. Okay, yeah, thanks. And then we'll get to other things okay. as we go along. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, can I have a couple of additional questions to that? Um, just, and I think it would be very helpful if we can get this in a written form, uh, Advocate Libba, is if we, you get a management fee, let's take the period while um, HFM was functioning from its inception to, to now, what exactly was earned in management fees? Were there any transactional or advisory fees that were paid? Did you have any operational expenses met by any other party? For instance, the PAIDF1, were any operational expenses met? And therefore, obviously we've said that the carry did not occur. What was the estimated fee in that composite income over that period? You can break it down per annum if you like and how much was then distributed to yourselves as earnings. So we know exactly what was the fee earned in this totality for um, HFM1, HFM, and then when this was transferred with PAIDF2 and H HGP, was the, what was the similar income in relation to fee, transactional in, uh, incentive, or advisory fees earned, and were any expenses, operational expenses, met by any other party? So we have a picture of exactly what the earnings are at this point in time for managing these funds. Okay? We'd be very happy to, to share that, Chair. That would be great. And uh, actually, perhaps as a matter of record, I might, we share our annual financial statements since 2007 with the PIC, we do like to share that uh, with them. So they do have that chair. And uh, so, so, so that is not, it's, 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 it's readily available. It should be available with, 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 uh, with Advocate Luber as soon as we know. We produce those every year without fail. Excellent. Can I add, because you see, once you give us, once people know about these fees and everything, you know, people have been saying you are earning fees and these fees are going to Lebashe and all that. So if you can really tell people, I think it will clear quite a lot of the issues, some of the issues about the fact that people say you are taking these fees and now you are, yeah, you are funding uh, Lebashe with those fees. Thank you, Chair, and I, and, and, and I really appreciate uh, the clarity of the way that you've put it, because actually, that actually never even crossed my mind that that's what they think perhaps Lebashe's fees come from. But I can say it was like you know, my, my, my heart on my, on my hand that that has never happened. And you will see that in terms of in our financials and everything for all the years since we've been in in existence. We will, we will gladly share that, Chair. 
just to jut in there, so are you saying that you have never used any fees from the funds to fund uh, Lebashe? But look, if the fees are yours, I mean, you know, Tepo Matlolo's fees, like it's your business, but are you saying broadly you actually haven't used the money from the funds to fund Lebashe? Not even broadly, Chair. Mm -hmm. We have never mm -hmm. used fees of health fund managers or health general partners for any activity of Lebashe. None. None at all. And, uh, you know, last year, when some of these initial allegations were made, Chair, we offered to all and sundry and the journalists and everybody and said, please come and look at our books. We are very open. It's sad to say that only one journalist came to come and check those and verify those and do a thorough interview with us in terms of that. Uh, so therefore, that is scrutiny that like we have always availed since last year when this was made and nobody took it up. Even when we responded in court papers, I think there was uh, one or two other journalists perhaps which cared to listen and read our submissions in court. I won't say which journalist, and I thank you for the journalists like not doing their work in that way. But everybody else has not cared to say what we have actually said, and this was said in an affidavit. But with regards to fees, anything of health fund managers or health general partners, not the cent, has funded Lebashe. On that open book note, can we take the tier adjournment, please? And, and Chair, can I, just two questions before we take the adjournment, just on this point, and then we can wrap it up. The first question is, that journalist um, that you sat down with, was, was any story ever written pursuant to that interview, after you'd spent your time explaining? Actually, uh, can I say, the general, actually it was, uh, it, it, it was business news, it was uh, Alec Hawk. He cared to listen and asked me and I offered, please come, I'll tell the whole story of myself, Stepo Matlele, of Harith and her friend managers, what this are, and also of Lebashe and how that was started. And he, and, and he wrote on that afterwards or he produced a podcast, I believe. He actually produced a podcast. And that has and been there since last year, about July. And then the second question is... And nothing between what I said then and what I'm saying today has changed. And the second question is, did Mr. Holomisa ever approach you for, for similar in, uh, information? Never. Never called. I remember very clearly we offered that thing in in our statement, that anybody please come and check and see what we do. The sad thing about all of that is that all these transactions are not some opaque kind of structure. All of these are listed. We talk about them in the media. We mention them. So therefore, there was nothing to hide. If there was anything to hide, we wouldn't talk about them in the open manner that we did. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We'll adjourn until quarter to 12.
Mr. Mashwele, you're still under oath. Just reminding you that you're still under oath. Mr. Mashwele, you, you were going to go to paragraph 22. Um, if your statement, you've confirmed your entire statement, so it's not necessary to read every paragraph, but I think you've um, covered from 21 all the way through to 27. But if, there's, if there are aspects that you wish to touch upon, I don't want to uh, cut you short. Just have a look at from 21 through to 27. It is background. I'm fine, Council. Can All I right. start on 28? You can, you can start on 28, yes. Mr. Baker, yeah. Just one or two things I wanted to ask. Um, I think maybe paragraph 24. Paragraph 24. Uh, I just, you know, need some sense in terms of HFM a fund one, sort of how many investments have been made uh, broadly, and uh, what was the ticket size, and then which sectors, just broadly, and how they're doing so far. Um, Commissioner, if, if, I could, if I could suggest, mm -hmm. there, is a, there is a document in the bundle. Uh -huh. um, if you look at page Three Page exhibit. three, yes. 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 So there are two documents. There's one at page three, which is the table of investments, PIDF mm -hmm. one and, and two. Mm -hmm. And then at page five is the project awards for the various investments. Perhaps, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Matuele, if you can speak to that. Yeah. Yes, I saw that. Um, I was not sure which was in, in fund one, which were in fund two. And two is that I was not sure. I see the project value is like 100% of the project value is not what PIADF invested in each, each investment. Am I clear? Am I clear? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So uh, just, just briefly, you know, mm. which way there is that power in Tanzania and, you know, like how things are going and all mm. that. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'll just try to go quickly through, through them, Chair. Uh, some of them, like, I don't like the, the exact ticket size of our check, but then, like, I'll more or less say, like, you no, know, what's like our percentage in that without being sort of like, you no, know, held to the exact percentage. But what I will do, Chair, I will share with the Commission uh, through uh, Advocate Labor all our developmental impact reports, which we produce every year and our integrated financial statements which we produce every year, which have a spell out in terms of all those things that we do and their performance. Good. Uh, the, the first one I mentioned there is a, is a Rabai power plant. It's, a, it's in Kenya. The project size was 72 million US dollars. It's a 90 megawatt greenfield combined cycle diesel plant providing power to a, major, to, to a major metropolitan in Kenya. We've got uh, Kelvin Power Station. Sorry, if, if I could. I think that if it's a question, um, colleague, if we were in a situation where you're going to read this into the record, I think yes. that we could take them as read rather yes. than have this read through. Okay. I'm okay. not sure if there's some specific questions that need to be asked, but I think it doesn't help us to actually read this whole thing through. We've got it in front of us. Perhaps um, to answer Commissioner Ledicha's question, can you, can you indicate which of these projects was PIDF 1 and which was 2? Are you able to do that? Yes, perhaps, yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Rabai, Kelvin, uh, Lake Tokana, PIDF 1. Azura Edo uh, IPP, the 450 megawatt power plant in, uh, in Nigeria. This was like one of the largest IPPs in Nigeria. That's in PIDF2. Amandi, the 190 
megawatt power plant in Ghana, that's in paragraph two. Main one, the 7,000 kilometer uh, fiber optic cable, that's in like West Africa, stretching from Ghana, Nigeria, right up and connecting into Portugal. CIVH, actually Sorry, that's- what, 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 is, what is main one, is that? Main one is a subsea cable stretching no, 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 from- No, no, is it PIDF that's one PIDF, or two? That's PIDF one. Uh, CIVH is actually our investment, which is like you know, our share in uh, dark fiber Africa, which is like a, a South African fiber optic uh, uh, company. That's in PIDF1. The Henry Conan Betty Bridge, that's a 30 year concession of like you know, a tall bridge in, uh, in, in Abidjan. Bongwe. In which uh, one or two? In uh, PIDF1. Bongwe, that's uh, the. SADC uh, community head office in Habrone. That came as a package with some one other two infrastructure assets we bought from, uh, you know, a portfolio uh, for, from a company. Is that also PIDF1? That's PIDF1. Uh, Novo Energy, that is like, you know, an entity we're trying to build, which will focus on like, you know, wholesale of gas in South Africa and build up, you not know, building up the gas sector in South Africa. That's in PIDF2. Uh, Lanceria, that's in PIDF1. TAV, airport, those are two airports in Tunisia, Monastir and Enfida. This is in Tunisia. Uh, traction, this uh, like, you know. TAV is in? TAV is in PIDF1. Uh, traction, uh, this is like, you know, an entity focusing like on the, on, on the rail industry. That is in PIDF2. And OCL is a, uh, is the largest like Malawian telecoms operator and that is in uh, PIDF2. That's great. Um, just one or two examples in terms of how do you, how are they doing? I mean, how do you get your money back? Is that through concessions or user pay systems? And um, are you getting some capital profits or this is just mainly cash flow from these investments? and hence uh, dividends and all that. Just briefly, okay, you okay. Know, just to understand how this, these investments are doing. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, the, the, there are different ones. In the power sector, most of them would be a 20 or 30 year concession from a government, wherein like, you know, then like we build, uh, finance and operate a power plant that supplies power to that particular you know, country. In the case of uh, Lake Tokana, for instance, it's, a, it's the largest wind power project uh, on the continent of about 310 megawatts, you know, with a transmission line that stretches over 400 kilometers from the northern part of Kenya. The project, all in all, you know, from conceptions by some local Kenyans to financial close and uh, now starting this year to sort of like, you know, deliver power into the Kenyan grid, I think it took nothing less than eight years. So that's the type of like, type of projects that sometimes it would take to do that. Then, and in that one, we supply on a 30 year concession uh, power to the, to the Kenyan grid. And this power plant, I think, like contributes about 20% to, to, to Kenya's sort of like power sector. So it is a major investment. When it was made, it was the, one of the largest for, uh, FTI uh, in Kenya. And uh, we have about 30% of, that, uh, of the equity in that project. It has about in excess of about 12 other uh, debt and uh, mezzanine sort of like you know, uh, providers to it. So a fairly large and complex project. And who pays you there? I mean, who actually pays the rates? The Kenyan government. The Kenyan yes, government. Yes, the, the, the concession. Yeah. It's actually, I mean, let, let, let me say, not like the Kenyan government. Mm -hmm. Well, what you have is like, there's the, uh, the, the equivalent, perhaps, of uh, an ESCOM, which is what we contract with, and then we like, you know, uh, contract with that entity. But then that comes with uh, a Kenyan government uh, guarantee. In some instances, we do take uh, political risk cover. In some uh, instances, when we are still learning the ropes, there is one or two sort of like 
uh, projects initially for something like perhaps uh, TAV, which are like the two airports in, uh, in Tunisia, which is Monastir and Enfida, which was like in the early years of our investment cycle, we, we, we unfortunately failed to take political risk cover there. And when the you know, Arab Spring hit, you know, we, we lost our shirt a bit there. But we're hoping that that's a 40-year concession and then we're sticking around and then uh, we'll see what happens. But with a 40-year concession, with Tunisia coming back on stream, that's what will happen. And in that case, you know, we, the concession is with the Tunisian government. So those, they are different. In a different entity, perhaps like, uh, like main one, the main one was initially meant to be like a subsea cable connecting like different countries and then like having the mobile operators buy sort of like, you know, uh, capacity from it. We got into that in the region of about 2000, I think 2008, 2009. The industry has since changed. You no longer get this sort of like, you know, 10 and 20 years sort of like, you know, uh, off-take agreements from the mobile operators. We've needed to change the business model to one whereby like, you know, the entity is now directly supplying to banks, to like, you know, universities, to ISPs in West Africa, in the, in the different uh, economies. So therefore, uh, they change. Sometimes like change is forced upon you by technology and uh, disruption like we did have in main one. Thanks, yeah, thanks. And then so it sort of it means that Lake Tukana is more like the, the, the ESCOM and the, the IPPs which we normally have here, basically. Y yes, Lake Tukana would be like the, the IPPs we have here. With ESCOM paying, with them, ESCOM paying yeah. them out and all. Yes. Okay. But the nice part about that one mm -hmm. is that the, the PPA is in euros. Okay. All right. Which is hard currency. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you, Chair. <laughs> Can we go to 28? Can I go on? 28, yeah. 28. Just to bring the matter back, as far as the PIC is concerned, to bring the matter back to its present context in the light of Mr. Holomisa's accusations and speculations, the significant fact is that the PIC secured the 46% stake in the management company uh, without exposing itself to too much risk since the repayment of its uh, you know, 22 million rands in uh, uh, cost and interest. The PIC exposure was limited to its seed capital loan. There's been no other funds or anything that the PIC has provided to Harith in any form or whatsoever since operations and the management of the funds started. If I may even like highlight it, there was a time even, on, okay, I won't even get into that one. Uh, you're still on 29? The PIC's exposure was limited to its seed capital. However, the total benefit to the PIC for its 46% shareholding in Harith Fund Managers as at May 2018 is now in the sum of almost 96 million rands. Mr. Olomisa's conjectures and suspicions that Harith Fund Managers is underhandedly engaged in illicitly or frivolously investing the funds of the PIC for the benefit of an elite cartel within the management team and is therefore fragrantly risking the life saving of innocent civil service pensioners is therefore entirely nonsensical. If anything, the PIC has greatly benefited from its stakes in Harith Fund Managers and Harith General Partners. And I might even take the point to know that at this stage, I reiterate again, the funds that Harith Fund managers, managers, all come from the investors directly into PIDF Fund 1 and PIDF Fund 2. There are no investment uh, monies by PIC in those two funds. And in that regard, even in reporting, in decision making, of those investments, all the investments that I've listed that we have across the continent, all that reporting, 
investing and making all the investment decisions is by the investment committee of the funds. As far as the PIDF was concerned, the intention was to raise the billion dollar fund after a period of 18 months had been spent on fundraising on the continent and internationally. This is what the seed capital was spent on. In addition to all other setup and related administrative costs, the loan was paid back to the PIC within two years with the interest and costs. By September 2007, Herath Fund Managers had secured $625 million for the PIDF, thus becoming the first 15-year infrastructure fund of its size and scope ever to be established on the continent. Fundraising, especially for a new fund in Africa, pursued by a small team lacking any real funding track record, proved to be complex and a lonely task, and it required enormous resources of time, persistence, negotiation skills, and faith. Every time when I tell people about the funds that we raise, Chair, I actually say that with regards to our focus and on the country, we actually have a triple whammy. First of all, you're trying to get to uh, convince people to invest in Africa on a long-term basis, in infrastructure, which is a long-term asset, and more so, most of our investments are green fields. A triple whammy of a focus in all in all. So that's the tough sell by any means, you know, trying to like anybody, but I'm glad that we did manage to do that and with some of our investors. The success in raising the fund was itself a critical milestone and one which all involved, uh, it's something that we were proud of and still remain proud of. And in essence, it has resulted in PIDF pioneering entirely new ground on the continent that opened up the way for the other numerous Pan-African infrastructure funds now available in Africa. By July 2009, the fund had its final close with a committed capital in an amount of $630 million. The investors, when we closed at that stage, were the GPF, APSA Bank, the Development Bank, African Development Bank, All Mutual, Stanlip, SNIT, SNIT is the Ghanaian Pension Fund, Momentum Metropolitan Holdings, and the ESCOM Provident and Pension and Provident Fund. It is important to note that contrary to the conjecture of Mr. Holomisa, the decision of the GPF to make the investment in the PIDF, I reiterate again, was entirely independent of the PIC. The GIPF was and is managed by an independent board of trustees, the head of which at that stage was Mr. Martin Kaskas. None of the directors or otherwise involved in the management of the PIC are involved in that decision. About half the GEPF board consists of representatives from labor and unions, and the other half are government employees nominated by government. It was accordingly an independent decision of the GEPF to invest in the PADF and to permit health fund managers to manage the funds so invested. Exactly the same principles applied and the same situation obtained later when it came to the investment of the GPF in PADF 2 administered by Harris General Partners, which I will deal I will deal with further below. The question, investors, a question here, uh, just in terms of Fund One, what is it fully drawn down now, and is it uh, so fully invested? Yes, uh, the Fund One is fully drawn uh, down. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, I think, there's less than about, you know, without. I can't give you the exact figure now because I Roughly. haven't checked it, but I can provide it to Rough you later figure, today. Yeah, you I think it. there's less than even uh, nothing in excess of about 10 or 15 uh, million, million sort of like dollars of the commitments left, mm -hmm. which are also supposed to cover, even for the remainder of the period, uh, the management fees. So therefore, there's a stage at which the fund itself must be self-funding, mm -hmm. and then beyond the committed amount of the investors, mm -hmm. we cannot even further draw down on PIDF1 or management fees of those, yeah. and which goes to the whole sustainability of our model and how, what, why HGP was needed to be developed. Then what do you do if you got staff who have been doing the, like investing the money, and now it has come to an end? I mean, do you, what do you do with them? Because 
That's exactly the reason why, Chair, we actually created HGP, because we have now built up a team of people who've managed to do these activities over all these years very well. It's an IP which we thought like, you know, has like, you know, done a lot of good, learned some lessons. We've actually even developed our own like, you know, 10 commandments of what to do and not to do in infrastructure. And then, then what then do we do with that sort of like, you know, team and capacity? And that's why, you know, from about 2010, 2011, we started saying that run about 2013, 14, we would have run out of funds in terms of like, you know, uh, PIDF1. What then do we do? We cannot then start laying off people. That's why HGP was then created, to say to have that continuity and have a new uh, entity going forward. And I will say, as I read further down, how that process happened. Okay, thank you. Can I just ask a couple of questions? If one looks at uh, PAIDF1, and the funding raised, it is about 10% of the fund that is not South African. That includes the African Development Bank, so the, that 90% of that funding raised was from South African entities. Uh, I would say so, uh, Chair, yes. So it's focused really, I mean, you did not necessarily get the buy-in that you wanted from the other countries and their pension funds. This is basically, PIDF is largely South African funded. And then if you went to PIDF 2, it was 435 million US dollars, of which only 35 million came from outside. So PIDF 2 actually was even less responded to from external to South Africa. Uh, yes, Chair, but if I may explain. No, I think that's, okay. I, I just wanted to get the position right around it. We can explain later. We just a little bit, I don't want to get stuck here. I just okay. wanted clarity that in actual fact, this is largely South African driven in terms of the investment, if you don't mind. And then the second question that I would have with that relates to moving from um, HFM to HGP. I don't understand the argument. Uh, why would you not just go back to the founding shareholders in HFM and say, we want to expand the nature of our investments, we've got the team, we're working on it, and we're going to do broad, more broad and change your mandate rather than create another company? Why would you go into another company with other shareholders, changing the shareholding, and all the issues that arose out of that? Because there, and we'll come back to that if, in, in, later on in your testimony, um, to say that you needed to create another fund to do additional investments, why would you not have just changed the mandate of PA of, uh, of your first fund? Uh, your, your management team, it's your HFM. Yes. Chair, we did do that. We went to APSA. We went to All Mutual. And uh, if you also remember, at the time, I think after about 2009, 10, and everything after like you know, the whole uh, you know, financial crisis and everything, APSA took a decision to stop investing in, fund, uh, in funds and fund management, also because of like you know, Basel 2 and 3, and decided that they would not go on into new fund management business. And, then they would, and also because like also investing in funds of that nature on that long-term basis affected their capital adequacy sort of like, you know, ratios and all that. And at the time, Old Mutual uh, believed that it was going to focus more on its partnership that it had with Macquarie in AIM, in which day it had like more of a 50-50 sort of like percentage. And it actually that was starting to even... Uh, 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 compete with some of like you know, this in, 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 in the same space for some of the assets. The, as a result of that, the shareholders and the board decided that they will not expand the mandate of Harris Fund managers beyond that of managing PIDF1. And that's exactly what happened. And as a management team, we did that. There was board uh, meetings, there were board strategy sessions, and uh, that couldn't, uh, the, those shareholders decided to do that. We went to the PIC and uh, we said, as management, we'd like to continue, we'd like to, like, with this 
think of raising another fund and uh, continue because we've got the team, we've now built up some uh, skills, some infrastructure, some knowledge, some like networks, some pipeline. Uh, PIC, would you like to continue in the new in, in, in a new fund manager that we will establish, which can do multi funds and that. Uh, and the initial thing we said to the PSC, would you like to take? Uh, and and we, uh, to, 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 to be frank, even at that stage, we actually said to the PSC, you know, we can partner with you even more in terms of like doing that, because at that stage, I think also like the PSC had also like. Uh, started having an Africa-wide mandate in terms of its ability to do that. And uh, we said, can we partner with you in terms of like doing more things with you outside of uh, uh, South Africa based on your extended mandate, based on our you know, desire to continue as a management team and build up this platform? And we said, you know, you can have negotiations went back and forth whereby we said, uh, you know, we can have uh, 30% and then, you know, so that then we can partner together or uh, you can retain 10% to the extent that we say, you know, you do not, uh, then you can go and compete with us, do whatever you do, but by virtue of the fact that, you know, we recognize that like in the beginning, you know, PIC was involved in the support or the seed funding of health fund managers and it was to the tune of 46%. Even though PIC had now started investing itself directly in the continent, independent of, you know, health fund managers, we said, can we do that? Uh, back and forth ended up PIC deciding to settle for 30%, but uh, the, the the co-funding and that science never sort of like, you know, I think materialized outside of South Africa. Outside of South Africa, we have not co-funded or been in any project together or that much collaboration. But in South Africa, we have, for our own purpose, like, you know, invested in two assets, which is uh, Lanceria and, uh, and Calvin. They invested directly, we invested directly in those infrastructures. That, that's basically what happened. I don't know if it answers the question, Chair. Thank you, but in, just in addition, the, the GEPF was comfortable with the, the new fund because both of the monies are substantially theirs? Chair, I think the GPF's support has been phenomenal through this. The GPF looks after this investment itself. It has committed in this fund directly, again, itself. Uh, and also even for this fund, I think if for itself, it also negotiated an even lower fee by the fact of it being a significant investor. You know, from the normal, let's say like one and a half percent, I think to about uh, 1%, if I'm not wrong, by virtue of their, their support for this. And also I think by virtue of seeing what this investments in PIDF1 had done and continue to do, and how they have like contributed to that uh, uh, developmental aspect you know, in terms of like what infrastructure assets are supposed to do. So therefore, GPF, by on its own account, as a management team of Herald General Partners, we went there, presented to them, and that is the commitment that we got from them directly. Mr. Mashwele, um, Commissioner Marcus said, we can deal with this later, but there is no later in your statement. So if I could just ask you briefly to address that issue of if you want to say anything more about the 90% odd funding from South Africa uh, for PIDF1 and even lesser for PIDF2, whereas you were investing in, in infrastructure across Africa. So what was the reason that, the, that there was, comparatively speaking, less investment from the rest of the continent? more investment from South Africa? Uh, through you, Chair. Um, Council, if you look at the continent and uh, you look at the, uh, the development of the capital markets and you look at the development of their pension funds and savings industry, I think South Africa 
in many respects, like you know, is far more, is a bit more advanced in that respect than those. For instance, in our, I will not mention countries for lack of whatever. You know, many of the countries, when we went there and talked to their, it's not even their patient funds, they, talk, they, they call it the social security networks or like, you know, uh, savings, that, that those are pools of funds. In many of those, the, even their chief investment officers would not have been exposed to any investments outside of their country except buying government bonds and real estate within their own country. In many of those, there were some in 2007 that it was even by law that like, you know, because of some of like their debt arrangements that they had with some of the OECD countries, that they can't even invest outside of their countries. It's, it's a, as opposed to investing anywhere else outside of their country, they could also in, only invest in Europe. So that's the type of environment you found. We went to one of the North, Af North African countries and to the, you know, the pension funds were, managed, were like managed out of like the treasury uh, unit there. They told us that like, you know, uh, infrastructure investments on a user pay principle and concessions like will never work. That was like the scenario we found a lot in 2007. And in some of those trips, uh, Commissioner, we are even accompanied by the African Development Bank because it was actually very eager and very, you know, trying to do that at that stage. Uh, and even today, even for PIDF2, if you look at also what has happened, uh, the past couple of years, between 2009 to 2000 and about like 14, 15, you know, as also a result of like perhaps then the financial crisis, there's not been much recovery or change in some of those institutions. Where we've seen funds starting to like, uh, you know, mature more and do more is in a place like uh, Namibia. In Namibia, we manage a fund with local Namibian asset manager, but that fund is strictly restricted to, to Namibia. We manage that fund with an entity called InnoHerath. So there, that, that, that's the scenario there. In Nigeria, the pension funds, whilst they become a bit more organized and structured, they still do not invest outside of Nigeria. So we have formed there a partnership with a Nigerian asset manager and wherein the funds by Nigerian pension funds are, you know, 80% can only, 80% thereof can be only be invested in Nigeria and only 20% in, uh, in West Africa. So that's a scenario that you still find. North, uh, North Africa has been a bit quiet by virtue of like some of the challenges we've had in the past. Okay, thank you. Can we continue okay. with your statement? I think you're at paragraph 35. Your, your microphone. Okay. The investors were not required to immediately to pay over the full amount of their commitments as is practiced in the industry. They undertook to make the funds available as and when they're required by the fund manager, ahead of fund managers who drew down funds in line with demands of the relevant projects. Funds are not, hand, funds are not held idle in bank accounts to be drawn on as and when the fund manager pleases. What actually happens, they give the commitment as and when they approve a project. You then draw down, you send a letter of and before you do that, that must be approved by an investment committee of the investors and the board of trustees of the investors before you can draw funds. It's not a sole decision by the manager to do that. A question here, clarification. Um, in terms of the fund of the management fee, the 2% that you charge them, say at the beginning it was 2%, say, is it charged on the full commitment of uh, 630 or on the drawing, on the amount drawn down at that particular point? During the initial eight years, during the initial eight years, you charge 2% uh, on the initial 500 and 1.5% like no, on anything above that. So from day one, you would charge that way 
and um, get the money on a quarterly basis. On a quarterly basis, Chair. Okay. And from a governance point of view, I reiterate again that the investors are able to scrutinize all gains and losses made or incurred during the course of the investment cycles and of all the amounts utilized for the purposes thereof. We have quarterly valuations done, which are internal, and we have annual valuations done, which are external and independent of these investments. As a result, there's a high degree of accountability and transparency in the manner which HFFM accepted vis-a-vis -vis the investors. These principles are recognized as standard in practice in the fund management industry, but I'd like to believe that in HFM, I think they went much more in terms of being sort of like uh, partnering with a manager in the management and development of this fund. As of 31 March 2018, the GPF's initial investment of 248 million out of the 250 million committed by the GPF, which is about 2.3 billion, and forming part of the 630 million by all the other investors, was independently valued and audited at 279.3 million uh, of the fund. The gross IRR earned on this investment has been 6.2% in US dollar terms and about 11.7% in ZAR terms. Sorry, just for, for future or for, for clarity, I think you must be dollar to dollar. It does not help to look at RANDs because RANDs would reflect the exchange rate differentials. And therefore, it's not an earning necessarily from the entity. It is a result of exchange rates. And therefore, I think if it's dealing with dollars, give the returns in dollars, which is fine, you've done that. I'm just saying that when giving it in rands, it's a little bit misleading because you don't reflect the exchange rate differential that would have occurred. Noted, Chair. And uh, as we've seen, the, 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 the most of the African currencies in the past couple of years have actually taken a beating in terms of like, the strength of the dollar, so which has been a factor in some of these, but and, uh, very much noted, Chair. A question here, uh, paragraph uh, 37 again. Mm -hmm. Gross IRR. Mm -hmm. Just explain that, and then and, you know, and then explain the net one, net IRR, because mm -hmm. those are two different concepts, and mm -hmm. um, they could change these numbers uh, significantly. Yeah. The gross IRR was with respect to uh, uh, the funds would be like the the figure which is like net of uh, of fees, and actually that's why like you also see the difference like in the in the gross IRR in fund two being very high of about like 40% later on in the thing. Because it, in, in, in this one, it has been like in existence for the past 10 years, in excess of 10 years. So the, the, the fee factor would have come in there. So you then have a net IRR, which would be in the region of about, you know, 4%. All right. So yes. are you saying then um, the IRRs of 6.2, when you subtract the fees, goes to about 4% in, that in region, dollar yes, terms. Yes, in dollar terms, yes. Which takes you away further from the 8% the hurdle rate. The hurdle rate that, 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 rate that so for, 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 from our ability to participate in the carry. Sorry? Yes, from the ability to participate in the It takes you away further and yeah, further, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. But yeah. as I said uh, yeah. earlier on, I think the last couple of years, you know, forget even the Naira, in which like, you know, we have also some of most of our investments and how that has performed against the dollar and totally like, you know, like, uh, fallen quite uh, tremendously. And also even if you look at like, the rent between 2011 and today, you know, I, I sometimes make a difference to people that you know, in 2008, you know, to be a dollar millionaire, you needed 7 million rands. Today, to be a dollar millionaire, you need 14 million rands. And then that shows you the extent to which like, you know, these currency issues impact on the performance of our investments across the continent. And that's why I think in the later stages of our investments, we have focused more in terms of like, some of our uh, you know, uh, uh, concession sort of like uh, assets with more with hard currency type of like, you know, offtakes in the likes of like, you know, uh, Azura in Nigeria is like, a, it's like a dollar, sort of like PPA, Lake Tokana is a uh, uh, Euro PPA. 
So therefore, as I say, I still believe that like, you know, once, and some of these are still in uh, construction. Some of this like Azura still haven't come into, you know, uh, operation. So therefore we believe that uh, all things being equal, we'd like to believe that by the time, you know, we get to about 2023, 2024, we should at least be able to meet the hurdle rate that we promised our investors. Just to stay on here because it never comes up again. Mm. Let's uh, finish it off. Mm. Um, a 4% net IRR mm. in a private equity environment or a, you know, an infrastructure fund, that's, mm. that sounds pretty low, uh, generally, given that private, private equity seems to be doing, what, 10% per annum in dollar terms, more than that, probably. Am I right? I mean, How? broadly, private equity and infrastructure funds globally, they would do far more than the 4%? They would not, if you say they would do far more than the, 10, uh, the, the 4%, that would be a moot point. But then like 4% in our case is not something that we are also like happy about, but we think that should be improved. But for the 2008, sort of like 2009 vintage, if you look at like, because that has to also to do with that, that then takes into account when the fund was started and what like the things were there. The 2008 and 2000 sort of like vintages perform at about uh, six, seven percent. And we'd like to believe that we should be able to do that. When you talk about like, you know, uh, IRRs like giving you about 10 percent uh, in, let's say like in a, in a US market, developed markets, those would be your top tier end sort of like, you know, uh, managers in pure private equity. That's what they would be promising you. Not infrastructure. Would like to think that infrastructure would be much more correlated, perhaps like to interest rates, much more, uh, uh, not interest uh, and inflation, and then just maybe perhaps slightly better than that to give better than perhaps uh, government bonds. But would like to think that that is the um, number that we should be able to come out with in the end. And those numbers we are already seeing perhaps also even in our uh, fund two, but I think also maybe the other challenge I would say that we've had perhaps in uh, fund one was that you know we were also in the initial so like stages invested in a lot of more uh, development stage infrastructure assets prior to perhaps that, and so I think that affected us in you know one or two assets that we invested in then. But you are still uh, looking at about seven to eight percent in dollar terms over the long term, which is global benchmark, is that yes, what that you're saying? For, 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 for this, we still believe that we will be able to do that mm. by, the, by, 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 by the time this fund sort of like reaches its total maturity. Okay, all right, thank you. Can I continue? Due to the large pool of foreign capital raised for the PIDF and to its investment mandate, which ran across the entire African continent, the fund sought and received the Reserve Bank approval in compliance with South African Reserve Bank regulations. And this is like uh, clear in pages 71 and 72 of my exhibit. I also talk in the uh, clause 39, I think it's a repetition because I've also already dealt with what the PIC earned in terms of its like, you know, exposure to like uh, Harris fund managers. Uh, and uh, perhaps in this case, like, you know, uh, Chair, if I may, it seems like the person who's like done the best as opposed to the investors would be perhaps the PIC because of their seed capital, they've had an 189% you know, IRR, you know, so for, 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 for what it's worth. I now turn my attention to HGP. Can I continue? Okay. Clause 41. When Herod Fund Managers was established in 2007, it was envisioned that it would be a single fund manager. This meant that when the PIDF reached closure, the company would not be able to raise another fund and manage it under the same ent entity. Given this limitation, it was anticipated that it would be necessary to incorporate a multi-fund entity to manage further funds. Therefore, Herod General Partners was established following extensive discussions with stakeholders and after attaining the necessary approvals, including from the investors in the original PAIDF-1, which then became known as PAIDF-1. As its name suggests, Herod General Partners was mandated to manage several funds under a single umbrella. 
Can I perhaps also just make a note here with Harris General Partners and that actually Harris General Partners as was uh, noted yesterday by uh, council for Mr. Lumis that it was started in 2007. Uh, when I took the two shelf companies in 2007 to establish Harris Fund Managers, it was both, one was Cycad Investment Partners and one was Cycad Fund Managers, both in 2007. It was intended at that stage, we thought that, you know, Cycad Fund Managers would be the fund manager and Cycad Investment Partners would be the entity through which we would hold our shares as a management team in Harris Fund Managers. So to the extent that we ended up using uh, HSIST, which is a trust, as opposed to H, uh, uh, at that stage, second investment partners, which we renamed Harris General Partners, uh, you know, that stayed as a shelf company until we like, you know, started using it again in 2012, when we changed over to forming now Harris General Partners. And that shelf company, at that stage, then I was the only single director. And for the sake of clarity, and I think which is some documents which have already been provided to yourselves, uh, commissioners, is that it actually definitely shows that I was a director in 2007. When we changed over and started forming two uh, Herald General Partners, that's when you had all the other directors appointed in 2012 into Herald General Partners as we were moving the operations and the, the people and everything out of Herald Fund Managers into Herald General Partners. I hope that makes sense. Can I just uh, follow up? I think let's deal with this one once and for all. So HFM, what happened there? I mean, you know, in a nutshell, I mean, did you take the computers from there and the furniture and the IP, you know, the, the intellectual property of um, HFM into HDP. You know, people have been saying that you, are, you stripped off HFM, you know. What, has, what, what happened? I mean, what happened to the computers? What happened to the, all the, the brand and the IP and all that? The brand, <laughs> Hereth <laughs> remains. Uh, the, end, the main asset of Hereth Fund Managers is the management agreement between it and PAIDF1. That's what it gets for the fees. That still happens, and uh, it's still HFM, which then like, calls for those like, contributions from investors. So that remains. The people and uh, computers and... Uh, those issues, those moved to Herald General Partners. And the uh, fund management agreement with PIDF and the board, uh, remained with the board of directors. And there's the board of directors which still foresees that. And what then Herald Fund Managers did was get into a subcontracting arrangement between Herald Fund Managers and Herald General Partners, because Herald General Partners can now manage many funds. Because this, as I said earlier on, the other investors in Herald Fund did not want to uh, proceed with, uh, to do other, do other funds. So therefore, the people, the computers, moved to Herald General Partners. The fund management agreement, the carry, the fee being paid to health fund managers and then being paid through to health that remains with health fund managers. So therefore, that ability to still get the carry and still like charge fees for managing PIDF directly remains with that because that's a contractual agreement between health fund managers and PIDF for the life of the fund until the fund is dissolved. When it has moved, I mean, what, were they bought by the general partners or they just were transferred, you know, I don't understand. They were... Was they, were they valued or were they bought by the other company or... Yeah, like they were a, bought... Like it's a small point, but I, yes. I just want, you know, it's small yes. money, it's small money, but I just want to <laughs> understand the process, you know. Yeah. yeah, they were all 
brought into, let's like the computers, because besides that and the furniture, there wasn't mm -hmm. much. Yeah. It was all like uh, taken into her general uh, partners. But for the sake of, you know, being 100% you know, certain as to like how that thing, you know, legally and think there is actually an agreement okay. between HFM yeah. and HGP mm -hmm. to that effect, which we will share with you. Yes. And there is also approvals by all the investors in PAIDF1 yes. that Herald Fund managers can subcontract the management to Herald General Partners. Oh, we will yeah, supply all that yeah. to yourselves. That's clearer now. So yes. you are saying then the carry is still in the, HFM. the main company. Yeah. And uh, what you normally do is the management fee, when it's paid by fund one, yes. gets transferred to HGP because yes. that is the main thing, really. Yes. And because of the agreement which yes, you've yes. got yes. as a subcontractor yes. to HFM. Exactly. Is that, is that, that that's exactly the way it is. I think we retain about 5% or so mm -hmm. in HFM mm -hmm. or 10% for its operational things, for like you know, the audits, yeah. for it to still have the board meetings, yeah. because it still has those four shareholders still having board meetings yeah. and to do all that. And even the audited financials mm -hmm. of HFM are still produced and we can still share all those with yourselves. And the 95% of the fees goes to HGP because yes. that's where the skills are and all the issues. And the are. running around, and the, the running management, around. the judicial, the evaluation, right. the using of the computers, okay. of all those things you said. Thank the distributed you. computers, okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank yes. you. At that point, did HGP have the necessary licensing and regulatory approvals to do that work at the time when you transferred it? All those were secured, uh, a chair, and they are, I think if they are not in here, and even also with the, the registration with the Financial Services Authority, and also with the approvals that we needed, even for PIDF2, we needed Reserve Bank approval. We've got those. So those were also like, you know, uh, obtained. So all those were done. At the time that you started working with HGP, all of those approvals were in place, and the regulatory approval and the licensing was all in place? All in place, Chair. We couldn't start managing and doing some of those functions unless uh, we are. And also some of the tests done, which a private equity fund manager needs to do in connection like as regulated by the Financial Services Board at that stage, all done. And passed. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Commissioner, can I just perhaps ask my learned friends, the witnesses under oath, to check that because my information is contrary to what he's stating. I'm sure you've noted that, uh, uh, Mr. Berger. Does this relate to the approvals necessary? and the licensing. You want us to check that? Okay. We've noted. Okay. We will check that. I, I find it odd that we will operate without it, but then we'll be able to do that, the licensing of HGP. Okay. Continue. Therefore, Herod General Partners was established following extensive discussions with stakeholders and after attaining the necessary approvals, including from the investors in the original PIDF, which then became known as PIDF-1, as its name suggests, HGP was mandated to manage several funds under a single umbrella. Approvals for HGP under the Public Finance Management Act were duly sought and obtained. If you see pages 99, 202, and 103 in Exhibit 3, if I may go there. On the 23rd of April, 20, 
12, there's an approval. There's a recommendation from the Public Investment Corporation to the Minister of Finance, then Mr. Pravin Godan, for the participation by PIC in Health uh, General Partners. And as clause 2.3 on page 100 of the exhibit says, Health was formed to manage the funds of Pan African Infrastructure Fund only. However, the Health management is of the view that Health has now reached a point where it can manage not only PIDF but other funds as well. In addition to that, PIDF is, a close, is close to being fully invested and second fund PIDF2 must be established. And all mutual and APSA were not keen in expanding the Herath Fund Manager's mandate then. PIC intends to take part in the new structure by acquiring 30% shares of the issued capital of Herath Partners. And the PIC board has approved this acquisition. Copy of the extract of the board minutes were attached for the minister's reference. The consideration for the 30% share acquisition by PIC will be a nominal value for the equity, which is currently anticipated to be 30 rands. This was the pro uh, proposal recommendation done to Minister Pravin Godan in April 2012. And uh, that recommendation signed by then the legal department, the CFO, and the then CEO, Mr. Elias Machila, and recommended by the uh, Deputy of Minister of Finance, then, which was uh, uh, Mr. Antlantla Nene. And uh, the approval take a while to come through between uh, application to, uh, by the PIC to the Minister of Finance, which approval comes through uh, on the 15th of October, 20, 2012. Proposed acquisition of a 30% shareholding in Herath Partners. I refer to your correspondence regarding the pro pro proposed acquisition of a 30% shareholding in Herath Partners by the Public Investment Company. And this was uh, approved then. This is page 103. Mr. Mashele, mm. I've, I've just been advised that you were speaking about somebody you, you spoke about a Mr. Masila or Mr. Machila? No, Mr. Well, when the, 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 the application was done and, uh, and, and recommended by the PIC to participate as to the extent of, to participate to the extent of 30% in, uh, in uh, Harris General Partners, then in April 2012, the CEO was Mr. Uh, Masilela, not Machila. And the chairman was Mr. Nene. Paragraph 42. With effect from 1 April 2012, Herald Fund Managers resolved to subcontract to Herald General Partners. That's the time when then uh, Herald General Partners, we started registering all the other shareholders, not the shareholders, the directors uh, to it uh, in the form of, I think that's when the likes of Mr. Muleketi, Mr. Anthony Ball, some of the PIC directors, then also became directors of uh, Herald General Partners in 2012. Sorry, can we, can we just be clear on the dates because approval according to the letter that you read uh, early on page 103 yes. was in October 2012. Yes. Did this occur prior to that approval or post that approval? The, what, the, you, what you reflect in paragraph 42, prior or post? The, well, the directors. The directors, some of the directors were appointed to the board of HGP prior to the approval of the minister approving the participation of PIC to the extent of 30%. That was what our take on that was that, you know, the, the recommendation has been done up to the level of the Deputy Minister of Finance. It was in April, 
and then it took a couple of months until October for the approval to come out of the Minister of Finance, which was in October uh, 2012. But then the usage of, uh, uh, I think, HGP, because we had all the approvals by the investors to subcontract to HGP, that was uh, done then. I, I can get the exact, it's like when the things moved over, but I think it was in 2012. The, the, the directors I know to, the, to HGP was in 2012, if I look at the CIPC thing. Which month, I'm not exactly sure. The CIPC showed that it was in May. Okay, yes. The restructuring from HFM to HGP paved the way for the formation of the second sorry, fund. So, 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 can I stay with paragraph 42? You know, like people have said that, you know, you work in various companies in terms of your time allocation, you know. Um, I just want to know which CEO of which company are you and where do you, where are you a director? Just, just explain to us those three, those three or four companies, I mean, are you stretched in terms of being able to manage, you know, PIC funds and all that? Uh, I do not manage PID, PIC funds. I manage PAIDF funds through PIDF1 and PIDF2. And I'm CEO of Harold General Partners. And Harold General Partners subcontracts the work from Harold Fund Managers. That relationship is clear. All the other entities which are, as a result, under, you know, which are the investment uh, companies of the funds like DFA, Lanceria, Novo, Energy, Lake Tokana, some of these entities, those are as a result of being CEO of Harold General Partners and managing the funds of PAIDF. The other entities in which I have my private interests, I'm not the executive, I'm the chairman thereof. And uh, I dare say that I think uh, uh, it is not unusual for people or asset managers or other people to have like, you know, other private interests which they do. And my performance and management of uh, Harold General Partners is managed by a board and which I report to and our reporting and everything to all the funds is all done through through HGP and my interests which I will talk about in in uh, in Lubashe, those are my uh, private interests which I which I hold is the sort of the MD of uh, Lubashe, the CEO of we, we have uh, Warren Whitley doubling up as uh, both the CIO and CEO of uh, Lebashe. He runs with that on a daily basis mm -hmm. with a small team that supports him. Mm -hmm. All right, so you do not spend a large amount of time at uh, Lebashe? I don't know what is a large amount of time, but I spend a large amount of my time managing Harith mm -hmm. and its funds. And uh, I will say, I do look after some of my interest in the Bashe. There is time that I spend on that. That is all declared mm -hmm. in my declarations okay. in all the companies that I sit with mm -hmm. and my declarations in the Bashe and other private investments which I have are all declared in the, in the Harris board. Mm -hmm. All right. In the and I'd like to think that perhaps what I do and what is done, I've seen many other people mm -hmm. with even more capacity than me doing that, even much more than what I am doing. But I want to believe that I, add, uh, I do what's necessary in terms of like my job in both these two private entities and what, how I serve them. Can I continue? 
paragraph 43. 43, yeah. The restructuring from Herald Fund Managers to Herald GP paved the way for the formation of the second fund, which became known as PIDF2, which reached first close in June 2014 with total capital commitments of $435 million. Reserve Bank approvals were duly obtained for these, and this is in page 107 to 112 and uh, 113 to 118 of Exhibit 3 that I've provided. So the Reserve Bank approvals, even for those, were obtained, and they have been attached. HGP became active in October 2013 with the following shareholders, 70% as to Herald Holdings, and 30% as to the PIC, which it acquired for the 30 bucks that I talked about earlier. Herath Holdings, in turn, is held 100% by Her HHET, in which its skilled employees participate in the manner described above. I think that it says HSIST. I think that's meant to be HHET on yes, uh, paragraph that, that 45. That is the correction in paragraph 45. Yes. yes. HHET. -E e Yes. Sorry, can you just explain that to us? What is HHET and how did Harith Holdings come about? What the... This is just the first reference to Harith Holdings that I've seen. So just to get a better explanation of that. Oh, okay. If you, in the structure which I think was provided, I don't know which like thing it is, you see that HGP, Harith General Partners, is held as to 30% by PIC and 70% by the management team. But that 70% is held by an entity called Harith Holdings PTY Limited. It's in that legal structure. And HHET is then all the 29 employees of Harith, how they participate you know, through uh, an employee share incentive scheme in that, in Harith Holdings through that trust. So the so employees... What is the relationship to HSIST then? HSIST participates to the 30% in Harith Fund Managers. We didn't change the shareholding of HFM as I said earlier on. The, the shareholding of HFM remains for the 6% PIC, 12% APSA, 12% All Mutual, and 30% Herod Share Incentive Scheme Trust. In that entity, we use the trust to hold the shares directly in HFM. In Herod General Partners, the shareholding of the management as to the 70% is held through Harith Holdings PTY Limited. And the okay. employee okay. share trust created for the employees to participate in Harith Holdings is then called HHET. And that, that appears from Exhibit 7B as well. That's, that's, that's the list of names of the trustees, a bigger part of the beneficiaries in HHET, which is the trust that falls under, yes, but it's, 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 it's the equivalent of HSIT yes, in HGP. In, 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 in HGP. Mm. And I might also, since I think it was also like referred to yesterday, that uh, HHET, there's participation by uh, uh, Jabumile Keti in there, in 2015, we put to the, the initial entity we put together, which we know we have since not uh, used and used a different entity. We were thinking of bringing, you know, into uh, the company uh, maybe other black entities, and then also maybe some of like the directors that we had and the team, and like to expand the breath instead of health holdings and we then created that trust. But uh, after that, we decided not to use that uh, uh, trust after some advice into like the way it's structured, issues of like how the tax will operate and a uh, 
new entity was then uh, uh, created and worked upon, which is then uh, uh, HH, it is also like called HHET, which new entity only takes into account you know, the current 29 employees of, uh, of Herald General Partners. We have since, you know, shelved the plans to bring in other shareholders until we can, uh, we have other plans going forward of creating very different structures in terms of like the building and financing of infrastructure assets, which are not uh, th uh, relevant for this, for, for this platform. And uh, in terms of like, you know, the, Participants in the first trust, which was in PIDF1, HSIST, you know, we have, I have provided council with uh, a list of all those participants in uh, HHST. And, that, and is, that is exhibit 7A. And also in uh, HHET, which, which is, is like the new uh, participants in uh, health holdings, you know, held through the trust, HHET, all those participants, 29 of them, as at like even the last allocations were done in the last financial year, 2018, those have also been provided to yourselves as to those participants okay. are. Just hang on a second there because in the list you've given us, I do not see Mr. Moloketi's name. Can you please just check that? And if I understand this correctly then, that in terms of this um, HGP, that the staff, this 29 member staff, actually are the, the holders, the 70% ownership of that fund, of that uh, HGP. 30% is PIC and 70% is your HHET. Yes, the team of 29 staff members. 29 people. Yes. Own that. And, and, just, and uh, we have, uh, uh, I think, after about 2015, 60, we resolved that, you know, uh, it will, the, whether we had staff of, like, intentions of increasing that to other B shareholdings and including getting other entities to sort of, like, grow the balance sheet of HGP, we since uh, shelved those uh, those, the, the, those plans. So therefore, the participants in uh, Herath Holdings, who have been now, we had the first two allocations, I think in 2017 and 2018, all those are the 29 staff members of the company. So the, the full complement is 29 people, and they're all part of this. Is that correct? Or only 29 people of the full staff complement are part of this? The 29 uh, people in HHET, I think, is the full staff complement. If we... not, it might just be perhaps one or two. But no, no, I, I think even our... I, I know that even, like, even something like one or two, there's two of our drivers, I think, if I may look at that, then I can just ensure that all of the, the whole 29 team players participate in it. Let me just, just verify quickly and, for and, you. And perhaps just clarify the position of Mr. Molochetti. Well, um, Commissioner Marcus, that, that's, that's exactly the point. Mm. Um, he's not on either, Mr. Molochetti's not on either list of HSIST or HHET. But why I'm raising it is because um, Mr. Montlelewe said specifically that Mr. Moloketi was part of it. No, 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 he said the opposite. Well, then I'm sorry, because I think I misheard then. Okay. Uh, I can just confirm. Yeah. In HHET is the whole uh, staff complement of everybody who works within Harith has participation in the 70%. Okay, and just to reconfirm what you're saying, because then I misheard you, was that Mr. Moloketi is not part of either. Mr. Moloketi has not a part of the participant That's in fine. the Harith Holdings uh, in, in terms of the allocations which have been done over the past uh, two no, years. My apologies then, because I then heard differently. Yes. Let me just say, just say, you know, a question. So give us a sense of the shareholding uh, within uh, HGP. Um, how big is your shareholding? You know, people allege that you own like 
the bulk of the shareholding there and all that. How big is your shareholding, Mr. Muleketi's shareholding? Just give us a sense if, it's, uh, if his shareholding is separate from the trust. Mr. Ledika, mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Ledika, I'm, I apologize, but mm -hmm. the point is, is that Mr. Muleketi does not have a shareholding. In, 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 in HDP, HDP. That, that's the point I just made. Oh, with okay, no, it was not, yeah, because I th thought it was separate, maybe, or something. No, and, 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 and then, and then, and then as, as regards the, the um, proportion of the, um, as between the, the different, benef no, different beneficiaries mm -hmm. in the HHET mm -hmm. as opposed to HSIST, yes. um, I, I'm not sure that that is um, a figure that needs to be mentioned. If the, yeah. if the commission is, is insistent, then we, we can take a position, but it it's yeah. really yeah. seems yeah. that that inquiry goes way beyond the terms he, of reference. I agree. I mean, if he wants to, it's fine, but I, I agree that, you know, he doesn't have to. He doesn't have to. Uh, can, can I, can I, I, I do can not. I, shall I allow you time to talk to council no. and consider that? No. Uh, I, I want to adjourn now for lunch until 1.30. Is that okay? We adjourn until 1.30.